Today, we will be taking a rare glimpse inside an antique bellows air gun. These were low-powered air guns used for short-range indoor target shooting, mainly in Germany in the 17 and 1800s. In this video, we're going to have a look at how it works, do some restoration to the bellows and also the stock, and then see how it shoots. First of all, let's see how it works. The entire mechanism is housed in the hollowed out stock. You have the bellows, which is mounted into a steel frame, which also houses the cocking mechanism and also the uh, secondary sear unit. See the air comes out the end of the bellows there. So this is fitted inside the stock and when in position the bellows lines up with the back of the barrel. So when the bellows puffs air it shoots a dart down the barrel and then the secondary sear lines up with the trigger which hits the sear and fires the gun. Now technically this is a spring powered air gun but it's not the sort of mechanism we're used to seeing. It's powered by these two very powerful V-springs which when they're compressed basically squeeze the bellows together. The bellows themselves consist of two wooden battens and these taper off towards one end uh, and become a tube. Now between them is sandwiched a folded envelope of parchment and this is what holds the air. Now you can see this is looks like it's leaking slightly so I'll have a look at that later. Now the mechanism is designed to pull the bellows apart with extreme force. Obviously because it will be acting against the V-springs. So it's housed in this metal frame at the back. And the way it works is there's a rotating spindle. And there's a chain attached to the front. And when you rotate the spindle clockwise, which is what you do when you cock the gun, the chain moves down. Now at the back of the spindle there's also a very solid cocking bar and when you rotate the spindle clockwise this moves up. The bellows have got these metal plates uh, top and bottom. The top one's got a socket for the cocking bar and the bottom one has got a connection for the chain. Once the chain is connected and we turn the spindle clockwise, you can see that the chain pulls the lower part of the bellows down, while at the back that cocking bar pushes the upper part of the bellows up. And that does this simultaneously. And obviously the V-springs would be compressed at the same time once they're actually fitted. The V-springs themselves are made of sprung steel. They're very strong. It's quite hard to compress them. So, um, yeah, we're interested in getting them back in. They've got these prongs on the end. And what they do is they locate inside these holes in the metal frame. So there's one at the bottom and then one at the top. And once they're fitted, uh, the bellows is supposed to fit between them. So there's quite a lot of preload um, to get the bellows in. The other end of the V-springs sit on these metal plates on the bellows. That means there's no direct force on the bellows when you're cocking it because the V-spring is touching one side of that metal plate and then the cocking rod and the chain is pulling the other side. So it's only these metal plates that take all the strain. It's quite clever. Once cocked, it's held back by this secondary sear unit, which works in conjunction with the set trigger unit at the front of the gun. Now to set this, you pull the lever at the back, which sets the trigger, and then touching the pin at the front, which is the actual trigger, fires the mechanism. So to cock the mechanism, 
you turn the spindle until it clicks and what's happening is there's a notched disc on the spindle which once rotated enough engages with the sear. So all that pressure is held back by the secondary sear unit and there's a very long arm on it giving a lot of leverage and that is what releases the mechanism allows the gun to fire. That's activated by the set trigger which is down the other end of the gun and that's how it works. Next I wanted to try and repair the bellows. So a quick test confirmed that there's quite a few leaks mainly on that main corner crease and also some under the metal plates. This called for some very intricate gluing and once I've done the corner hole uh, also tried to glue up underneath the plate and I used E6000 adhesive which is really good and uh, strong, glues leather well and is flexible but it takes 48 hours to cure so I'd glue it, test it, find another hole, glue it again and the whole process took about a week but eventually I got it sealed something I really wanted to do was to try to do something to preserve the parchment I got some glycol 400 solution which is what museums use to preserve old parchments now parchment is animal skin and what this solution does is it conditions it stops it drying out getting too brittle and cracking uh, which is definitely what I wanted to do for this so I put plenty on all the folding surfaces and you can tell it's soaked in because it makes it go transparent the last thing I needed to do with the bellows was to ensure that the breech seal was working correctly. Now when I got this originally the breech seal was very badly damaged. You can just see the end of the bellows behind it. Luckily you can fit the bellows just on their own so what I did was made these little plasticine blocks, pushed the bellows up against the back of the barrel which gave me a depth gauge for exactly how thick to make the leather seal. So that worked perfectly. Now came the fun bit, which was to compress these V-springs to a point where I could refit this unit back into the uh, metal frame. Now there's no reference to how you do this anywhere, um, so I kind of had to make it up. So what I did was I fitted these two mini G-clamps onto the V-springs and reconnected the chain. And then it was just a matter of slowly compressing the v-springs uh, with a sash clamp. I've sped this up a bit, it took a while. Just making sure they didn't move out of position or fly off or, or anything like that. So all I wanted to do was compress them to the point where I could fit those little uh, prongs back into the holes, those location holes on the frame. So after a while I was able to get the bottom one in and then a little bit more compression and got the top one in then eased off the sash clamp and it all held yeah that was a big relief when I initially took this out all the v-springs flew out and I didn't know how to put it back together so it was a big relief to actually finally get that done now I had to keep that cocking bar disconnected through this procedure so now I need to uh, reconnect that and that means I need to compress the upper V-spring with a sash clamp because there needs to be some clearance to get the end of that uh, cocking bar into that socket of the uh, upper bellows. So I've just compressed it, put a wedge in, then I can get the cocking bar lined up with a socket, compress it, take the wedge out and then slowly lower it into the socket. And that's it. Now before I fit the mechanism back in. There's just something I've got to do to the uh, inside of the stock. And it's to do with these two little dents in the bottom. So I think they're caused from the prongs of the V-spring that stick out through the metal frame, digging into the inside of this stock. And the other side that shattered, I think shock waves from the ends of those V-springs uh, is what cracked it possibly. So I'm just opening them up and I've done it to the broken pieces on the other side just so they're not pushing up against the stock for future use. 
and now I can finally fit the mechanism back into the stock. That just slides back in and the fit is perfect. The inletting around that metal frame is very precise. So now the bellows are pushing up against the back of the barrel and there's a little block on the end of the bellows which lines up with a hole in a stock and it's held in with a pin. And you can see there's the end of the long arm of the secondary sear unit and that's what's uh, activated by the trigger when the trigger's refitted. The broken parts of the stock now need to be glued back together. So there's a few cracks that get glued up and then for the actual separate pieces I put some non-stick backing paper between the stock and the metal frame so I'm not gluing the wood to the metal frame and then I just go through the pieces, clamp them in position and uh, piece by piece glue it all back together. The whole lot needed to be clamped and then left for 24 hours to cure. And with everything cleaned up uh, that looks pretty good. I'm confident now that will be nice and strong so I don't think it's going to crack again. And now it's just a case of final assembly. So I have to refit these brass plates. They screw through to the metal frame and I've edited out the part of me screwing them in because that's quite boring but the, they fit beautifully as well. The inletting on them is very precise. So with those screwing through to the metal frame that's quite solid and the, the whole of that mechanism now is locked in to the back of that butt. So I'm happy that's pretty solid. Uh, next was to fit the trigger. I'll be honest, I was a bit worried that maybe I would have missed something. And the thing that worried me would be that the, for whatever reason the trigger wouldn't trip the sear. And I'd end up with a cocked gun that I'd then have to take apart. Um, but I had faith. A feature you'll find on a lot of these old gallery guns are really nice ornate trigger guards and the one on this is particularly pleasing. The last parts of the uh, brass plates to fit are these two side plates and they cover up the pin that goes through the stock and through the end of the bellows and the one on the other side uh, also acts as a surround for the uh, barrel release catch. I had read somewhere that a lot of these brass panels were purely decorative on air guns but all of these definitely serve a purpose. So that's all the brass work put back on. It looks really nice actually. It contrasts beautifully with the walnut of the stock. And there's a few more brass fittings for the uh, ramrod and yeah it looks really nice. So the very last thing to fit is the bracket for the peep sight. Now when you see a lot of these old um, bellows guns or, or early target air guns, they often have their peep sight missing and I think it's because they're uh, removable. So I wouldn't transport this with the peep sight on because it's quite spindly and if it got knocked it would probably break and it's easy just to take it out so I'm guessing that's why so many of them have lost their peep sights. Now before I finally get to shoot it I had to make a dart. Uh, this air gun has got a whopping 8.5mm bore so I got some 8.5mm brass tubing, glued in a big sable brush, filed down an M2 bolt, left a little bit of thread on it to screw into the end and had a perfectly serviceable dart that should work really well. This air gun also didn't have a crank handle so I got a massive 15mm allen key and a 15mm uh, ratchet head and the square socket of the ratchet head fit perfectly. I shimmed it up a little bit just to make it a perfect fit. I also put this together which was based on the sort of painted targets they used to shoot at the time and the black circle in the middle is about 20mm. Okay, loading procedure. Set the trigger. Turn the spindle clockwise till it clicks. Re release the barrel. Keep your fingers well away from the set trigger. Release the barrel. 
and put in our 8.5mm dart. Gently close the barrel. Keep your finger away from the trigger until you're just about to shoot and let's see if it works. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Well, I put the target about 13 feet away, which is about 5 mm. yards. Um, I've got a few other gallery guns that I shoot at a similar distance. It's probably the kind of distance you'd shoot if you were doing indoor target shooting across a room. Quite a scary feature of a lot of these old bellows guns is that the stock bends down with the barrel. So if you look at the front of the stock, it flexes down when the barrel tips down. That's quite terrifying. The ramrod, I think, stiffens it up a little bit. To be fair, the, the stock isn't acting as the spring for the barrel. The barrel has got its own uh, V-spring underneath it and a stop. But um, it still flexes quite a lot, which is quite scary. To be on the safe side, I always uh, support the barrel when I open it and close it. So it's a big gun. It's 48 inches long, which is 121 centimetres, and it weighs 4.6 kilos. It's got a big, heavy barrel. Uh, but because the mechanism is in the butt, it balances really, really well. And in fact, the balance point is pretty much exactly where you'd want it as a target shooter. There's a little bit of checkering exactly where your hand goes, so it was designed to be shot like that, and uh, it's very stable. One of the reasons I got this gun was after shooting John Griffith's bellows pistol. We did a video on that. and. I noticed that it didn't have any recoil, so I wondered what it would be like if you scaled that concept up to a bigger bellows gun. There's no horizontal travel of a piston or a spring. The V-springs uh, move vertically. So I suppose the cocking bar moves down, but there's no movement. It feels recoilless, really interesting. I even think the springs might be balanced because the bottom one's bigger than the top one. And I think that counteracts the <laughs> vertical moving um, cocking bar. Fantastic. The sights on this are really lovely. The rear diopter sight is a miniature work of art and the rear sight is fully adjustable for windage and elevation and interestingly it, uh, on closer examination I saw that the sight element seems to be made of a little block of silver. I suppose this would be uh, very useful if you were shooting a dark target. It's a very classy little detail. I've never seen that before on, on any gun. The front sight is your usual type of blade sight. It's very fine. The sights go together really well and they make a very precise sight picture. So this air gun is probably almost 200 years old and there was a little trick that the target shooters back then used to do and that was to colour in some of the hairs on the dark black and that's what I've done. And what you do is you always put the black hairs towards the top and then every time you load it, the dart is in the same orientation. Then all you do is you zero it to that dart. That means if you put the dart in the same way up every time, you should get some very consistent accuracy. I only adjusted the sights on this to uh, change the elevation for the particular distance that I'm shooting at and I didn't change the windage at all. On closer inspection you can see that these sights still have the original mark that the gunsmith put on them when he was setting them up. So they must have done a really good job of setting it up in the first place. Fortunately we know who this gunsmith was because it's marked on the top of the barrel flat. It has Bath Yoss Kuchenreiter in Regensburg engraved and inlaid in silver. Very nice lettering. Barth Jos Kuchenreiter is short for Barthelmos Joseph Kuchenreiter. He was the cousin to Adam Kuchenreiter and they were both members of the very famous Kuchenreiter gunsmithing family. They were best known for their high quality firearms, but the two cousins also made a small selection of very high quality air guns in the mid 1800s. Something that really stands out on this particular air gun are the extremely high levels of craftsmanship in both the set trigger unit, which has got some very highly ornate internal parts and beautiful cutouts, and also in the secondary sear unit, which has got a cover plate, which is 
a, a little work of art really um, these little square pegs don't need to be square because they're round underneath and the carving and shaping of that cover plate is spectacular but these parts would never be seen it's interesting I really hope the original owner knew what was inside this gun because uh, my appreciation of it is, is greatly increased knowing the level of craftsmanship that has gone into the mechanism on this. It's interesting to compare this to the later volute spring gallery guns that followed on from the bellows. This feels very different. It's got a shorter shot cycle and it's recoilless and it has a little bit more power at about three foot pounds. You don't really want much more power than that or you'll never get the dart back out of the target. This project has been really enjoyable. It's been great learning about this gun, seeing how it works, trying to make it work better and also to see what a bellows gun feels like to shoot because I've never shot one before apart from a little pistol. Unsurprisingly I am now a huge fan of this particular air gun. What a fantastic thing. Special thanks to John Griffiths for giving me some advice about what to use to restore the bellows and also a few bits of reference material. Thanks for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, please give it a like and subscribe if you want to see more. Auf Wiedersehen!